The uh, symbol that you see up there on the board is actually based in 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. And it, is, it means God is greater than the mountains and the valleys. God is greater than the mountains and the valleys. It's one of those Old Testament stories that I love to recount and love to cover. It's not really in our sermon, so we're not going to cover it very much. But it's where Ben-Hadad from Aram, from up north, came down against Ahab, who was in Samaria. And Ben-Hadad had a much larger army, and as he surrounded the city of Samaria, he said, you need to surrender. You're going to have to give me a certain amount of gold, a certain amount of silver, uh, a certain amount of your wives, a certain amount of your children. And Ahab, realizing the army that he was facing was much more, he said, okay, you can have it. Then Ben-Hadad came back and said, no, I want your pretty wives. And and Ahab was like, oh, no, we're going to fight then. And I've always just thought that was funny because, you know, among the harem, who decides who's pretty and who's not? You got some issues there, don't you? But as you go through and you see that, it's an important thing. God is greater than our mountains and our valleys. God is greater than anything that we face. And as you read through 1 Corinthians 2, you see where Paul is making this point to come across. Because a lot of people at this time were worried about the wisdom of man, the strength of man, what man could do. And Paul, what he says is take a step back and realize it's not eloquence that saves a person. It's not wisdom or experience that saves a person. It's not goodness that saves a person. It is God who saves people today. You and I are saved through the cross of Christ. You and I are saved by our obedience to the gospel. And so while many times you and I, we look at ourselves and we say, man, I hope I've done enough to be saved. I hope I'm good enough to be saved. I hope I've done enough good works in order to be saved. Paul would tell us today, if you're in Christ, if you have obeyed the gospel, if you are walking in a light, you are saved by Christ and not by your own works, not by your own goodness, not by your own ability. And so We see the passage here in 1 Corinthians 2, which matches Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. And so as we examine this, let's begin in chapter 2, verse 1, and see how we're not saved by human strength. We're saved by the power of God. Not by human strength but saved by the power of God. So let's go to our next slide there. And read with me, if you will, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, Paul writes, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellence of speech or with wisdom and power, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. As a matter of fact, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power, that your faith should not be in the power of men, but your faith should be in the power of God. What you see there is a picture of Tom Stoltman. Tom Stoltman is a Scotsman who uh, won the last so far World's Strongest Man contest. That big old granite stone that he's holding is 460 pounds. He lifted it. Uh, eight times in order to win the championship, along with many other feats of power. That stone which he is holding is about the equivalent of a piano. So if you can imagine somebody who would lift a piano or about half of a small-sized car, that's what he's just holding on his shoulder as he is smiling. That's probably his smile. (laughs) For the camera. Now, maybe you've been watching on TV. And you see guys who go down a mountain on one stick or guys who go down a mountain on two sticks or guys who are going down a mountain on a boat-looking thing. And constantly, as we watch the Olympics, we see that somebody has gone faster than anyone else. Someone has done a doopty loop quicker than anyone else. And somebody has done this or that or whatever and set a world record. And as we look around the world, We see people are healthier than they've ever been, stronger than they've ever been, able to accomplish things that they've never been able to accomplish before. And we see the power and the strength of men and women 
today. But what we got to recognize is no matter how powerful we are, no matter how big of a stone we can pick up, or no matter how fast you can go down a mountain on skis, God is greater than the mountain and the valley. Psalm 62 verse 11 says, You, O God, it is you who hold all strength. And as you and I read in the Gospels, we see a Jesus who can calm the storm with his word, a Jesus who can walk on water, a Jesus who by his very words can change water to wine, a Jesus who can stop the sun, a Jesus who through Moses was able to open up the Red Sea, a Jesus who is even able to bring the dead back to life. What you and I have to realize is that God is stronger than we are. And from the very beginning, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, man has tried to compete against God. Whether it's building a great tower of Babel, whether it's trying to create an alternative religion, whether it's trying to serve self rather than God, and every time that man competes with God, every time that man relies upon his own strength, man fails and comes short. Now, you may not be Pharaoh, And you may not be Nebuchadnezzar, and you may not be King Herod, but in your life, do you find yourself in struggle with God, desiring the things that you want, desiring to live in a way that you desire to live, following after your lust, following after your passions, rather than surrendering to God? Do you limit your life? Because you trust in yourself rather than trusting in God. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26 says, You see, for with God, all things are possible. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 tells us that he, that is God, is able to do immeasurably more. Is what the NIV says. The older translations say God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask, all we could ever think, all that we could ever imagine by the power given to us in his church. Let's remember today. You may be able to pick those big stones up in your life. You may be able to act in ways in which everybody honors you and everybody is is just praising you. But if you don't have God in your life, if you don't follow after Jesus, if you don't submit yourself to him, it's failure. It's short. Because God is greater than the mountain and in the valley. Now turn in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. Let's look at our next slide here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning there in verse 6, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, in a hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they have known, they would not have crucified the Lord God of glory. Magnus Carlsen is the world chess champion. And one of his talents, well, he has many talents. Of course, he is a master champion as far as chess goes. But in the last year, the year before COVID, 2020 or 2021, as he was working in Abu Dhabi in this championship, he went through six ties with a man who had been champion for the last two or three years. Magnus Carlsen is not only a great chess champion, he is very good at getting in other people's head. And when the other person he was going against finally made a mistake, he finally fell short, Magnus Carlson, by just his looks and just by a few words and just by the way in which he treated the other person, then defeated the guy he was going against three times in a row and became world chess champion. He's good not only at figuring out where the bishop and the knight and the queen should go, he's good at destroying whoever it is he's facing against. In many ways, he's not only the smartest guy as far as chess, but he's one of the most intimidating people who have ever, ever lived. 
Have you ever met somebody who is intelligent to the point in which it intimidates you? Somebody who comes across and makes you think that there's so much above you that you can't question, that you can't ask, that there's no way that you can be equal to that person, a person who intimidates you completely. Recognize your glory is not found in intelligence, it's found through God. Let's, let's talk for a few moments about wisdom. Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse 22, Paul's describing these philosophers, even in Rome. And he says, professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into a corruptible image, like a corruptible man, like a bird or a four-footed animal, and creeping things. James chapter 3 and verse 15 speaks of people who are like this. And he says, the wisdom which they have is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it is sensual. It is earthly and it is vain. Let's go to our next slide. And this may be a bit small. I'll read it along as we go through. I want us to notice some of the quotes. First of all, the quotes are in the black. First quote, everything that could ever be invented has already been invented. That's by Charles Duell. He ran the U.S. Patent Office in 1899. A guy 120 years ago, before spaceships, rockets, before cars, before computers, really before electricity, said, we've reached peak performance. We've seen everything that man has created. It cannot go any further. What do you think he would think if he was living today? You think he'd be impressed? Hope he would. Watson, 1943. His company was producing computers. Partially, he was working with the atomic project, but also he's working in other ways. And as they were putting together computers, he said, I don't see a market for what we're making. As a matter of fact, at most, only five computers could ever be used in this world. Right now, just about every one of us has a computer in our pocket. As a matter of fact, some of us are on there right now, aren't we? Warner Brothers Studios, Mr. Warner. When he was approached about the talkies, that is where the movies, instead of just being acted out, actually would listen to the actors' voices, he said, really, who actually would ever want to hear these people talk? You know, I kind of think that today sometimes, don't you? Politically? Imagine how much our movies have changed over these years. Fletcher, a lead economist in Yale in 1929, said stocks have reached a permanently high plateau. They shall never go any higher. In 1929, that looked to be the case, didn't it? But look at it today. I laugh at those people back there, but look up there in the white. Uh, Those are some quotes, um, sort of from me. The gas light turns on the car. Man, I've got a good 10, 15 miles. I don't have to worry about that today. Have you ever done that? Have you measured how far your car can go when the gas light turns on? Maybe. How about this one? You turn something on and you say, well, it's supposed to sound like that. Or it's supposed to smoke like that. It's only smoke for a little bit and it'll be all right. Or maybe not. How about at the job? Oh, the, bu- the boss won't mind if this happens. How about this one? You ever heard it? Forgiveness is easier to get than permission. You ever heard anybody say that? Sometimes people will bring that out, and sometimes people will say those things, and then afterwards we realize, oh boy, maybe I'm not as smart as I think that I am. God knows more than we know. And our wisdom, I'll go ahead and go to that next slide. God knows more than we know. And while we may win the chess match that we're in, if you're living by your own intellect, if you're living by your own intelligence, if you're living by your own reason, you're going to run into trouble. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish... The wisdom of this world. 
Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is greater than the strength of men. Verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame to the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame those things which are mighty. You'll have people who will tell you that a person is no different than a beast. We've all evolved from the same substance, and there's no such thing as a soul and as a spirit. You'll run into people who will tell you, it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what doctrine you hold, everything will be fine. Don't worry a bit about being faithful to God's Word. You'll find people who say, well, the Bible is just one book among many religious books, and there's nothing special about it. It is not inspired, it is not holy, and it's not separated. You'll find people who will say, God spoke to me and told me to do what I want to do. And I'm going to follow myself, my passions, and my desires rather than what Jesus said. We may feel like we're in charge of the chessboard, but God is the one who is in charge. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33, Oh, the depth and the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways above finding out. Isaiah 55, two chapters after what Jim read for us today in the Lord's Supper, talks about how God's ways are above our ways. And his thoughts are above our thoughts. And his word shall never return void, but shall accomplish whatever it is that he wills. Let's go to our third slide and look at verses 9 through 16. 9 through 16, looking there in verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of the holy God and that the spirit of God dwells within you? You, when you're a Christian had the Spirit of God within you, Acts 2.38, and not the Spirit of the world. Man's spirit says, I'm good enough, I'm holy enough, I am righteous enough, I'm sincere enough, I'm religious enough, and yet when you set us, a fallible, weak, sinful human being, against God, guess what it looks like? It looks like me out on the golf course saying, I'll take on Tiger Woods and I'm going to beat him. Tiger Woods may not be what he used to be, but he sure can beat me. It's like me picking up a basketball, pulling up my tall white socks that I wear because I'm a, you know, an old dad, as my parents or as my kids would say, and saying, I'm going to beat LeBron James. LeBron James may not be what he used to be, but oh, he would have fun dunking on me, and he sure could show me up. Tiger Woods is up here, and my golf game's down there. LeBron James is up here, and my basketball game is further down than I can reach. God is there, and me, a weak sinful being is further down than I can reach. And yet so many of us spiritually, spiritually live by our strength, live according to our desire, live according to our ways. God's spirit within us creates holiness, peace, intercession with God, and gives us a mind That is Christ, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. You see, we don't earn our salvation. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking there in verse 30, says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. How do we come to salvation? It's not by my intelligence. It's not by my strength. It's not by my spiritual nature. It's by my humble obedience to God. It's my hearing and reading 
as those did in Acts chapter 2, and they cried out, what must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's what we see there in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. It's what we see in 1 Peter 3, 21. Are you saved? Are you in Christ? It's by giving yourself to the Lord that you find salvation. It's by giving yourself humbly to follow after God every day that you give yourself the opportunity to be what God wants you to be. Let me assure you today, God is greater than the mountain and the valley. Whatever it is that you may be facing today, God is greater. Whatever it is that's holding you back from being faithful to God... God is greater. However it is that you think that you could improve on God's plan, that you think you could change God's plan, God is greater than the mountain and the valley. 